Hey you guys, it's Melissa here from MelissaOatman.com. Welcome to Awaken Your Inner Awesomeness, a daily podcast devoted to spirituality and self-help. If you're new, I want to welcome you. If you're returning, welcome back. So today we have with us a very special guest. We have Miss Maria Walsh, who is a holistic wellness coach. And her story is very interesting because she went from someone who probably did everything you can think of that wasn't good for your body to someone who now helps other people change their lifestyles so that they can be more healthy and, um, you know, just live a better life. So I'm so excited to hear from her today. Welcome, Maria. Hello, Melissa. Thank you for having me here. You're so welcome. I'm so excited to talk to you. So I always like to just start off by having my guests tell us a little bit about themselves just so we can kind of get to know who you are. And then maybe you can tell us your journey, some of your story, because you have a very interesting story and how you came to do what it is that you do now to help people. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. So yeah, um, I'm a holistic wellness coach and kind of just to take <laughs> go back in uh, a few years back to tell you guys a little bit about my story and how I got here. Um, uh, like Melissa said, I used to be someone who definitely did probably everything that's on the list <laughs> of unhealthy in terms of, you know, my diet was very high in sugar, very high in processed foods. Um, I did zero exercise. Um, I binge drank all the time. I took drugs. I, um, you know, I was really negative towards myself and really unloving with my thoughts and, and with everything really. The, the only way I knew how to look at myself was in a negative way. I really thought that integrating any kind of healthy habit in my life was just something that was never going to happen for me. I was like, I'm never going to be that kind of person that's ever going to be able to even just make a little shift to, to feel a bit better. And I was, you know, quite overweight. I was on the border of being obese. So, um, you know, during this time, I did sometimes try to make a few changes here and there, but it was always coming from a place of kind of self-hate and lack, you know, like, oh, I need to lose weight. And then if I do that, I will then be accepting by other people or by myself or, you know, it was always um, kind of like a stupid diet that really is even more unhealthy and it just a quick fix. I was always going like this. And um, that was, you know, my lifestyle for, for many years, I would say for nearly a decade. And then um, I think around 2015, my dad got cancer and passed away. It was something that happened really quickly, like in a few months. It was less than a year that the whole thing happened. And, and his specific cancer was very much due to his lifestyle because he was a heavy, really, really heavy smoker and he died of lung cancer. Um, and this was just a really massive wake up call for me because at the time as well, I was going through a period of intense stress and having panic attacks and you know all these different things and I at the time I didn't think that you know your lifestyle and your mental health was connected now that seems <laughs> really obvious right yeah but at the time it was not obvious I, so I um people don't realize that I think a lot of people mm -hmm. don't understand how connected that all is so I love that you bring that up yeah definitely and I mean like to give you just one tiny example it's like um, you know, I work with a lot of women who struggle with sugar. And one of the things that sugar does is it can calcify your pituitary gland, right? So even just like that kind of instinctual kind of um, gut feeling of intuition, you're just blocking it off, right? And then, then there's, that's just one tiny example of a million different ways it's affecting you. So yeah, once my dad um, passed away, it was like a really big wake up call. And it wasn't something like the next day I changed everything, but it was it was the wake up call to be like okay you know how am I living my life am I really coming from a place of, of self-love am I really you know building myself up for the kind of life that I want to have like do I just want to die young and 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 be sick really that was kind of the, the big thought that was going through my mind so um this is when you know I began to change from a place of self-love and I was like okay how can I live better because I deserve better as a person? And that was the biggest kind of mindset change. You know, like I, I'm worthy of taking care of myself. I'm worthy of having a good life. I'm not saying that the next day I was like, oh, everything's amazing. I love myself. You know, it, it doesn't happen that quickly. 
but that was like the one big step towards really implementing changes in my life and it began with small things you know changing my diet a little bit doing a little bit of exercise and you know um every tiny little habit that you that you build up you develop a little bit more confidence in yourself and that really is a catalyst for for much much bigger change yeah, I love that because I think most people, that's probably one of the biggest reasons they don't ever do anything and they don't want to change is because they think you have to do everything all at once. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the next day they're like, oh, I have to start a new diet and I have to, you know, I have to do all of these things and they get overwhelmed and they quit before they even start. Oh, definitely. A hundred percent. And I always tell like my clients that sometimes I'm like, just, just sit set one habit, right? It could be something as simple as drinking a glass of water first thing in the morning, right? Just one thing that you know is gonna, you know, change, improve your life a tiny, tiny bit, right? Because it's not about these massive changes, it's about tiny habits that you can actually stick to and that are actually sustainable, right? Because that's the, the biggest thing is it's something that's sustainable, something that you enjoy, something that you can get on board with. And once you do that, like you develop more confidence in yourself. And then once you develop more confidence in yourself, you're more likely to take on a bigger challenge, right? And you build up resilience and not just in that area of your life, but you end up building resilience to other things that happen, right? You, you just end up having so much more confidence. So it doesn't, you, you don't get beaten down by tiny little mistakes and little things that happen for sure. Yeah, that's so great. That is such a great tool is to just have those little wins built in so that when you experience that win and you're like, oh, look how amazing I am. I got up and I drank mm -hmm. water this morning or I did a 20 minute workout, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Those little wins are what fuel you to push yourself even farther because you're like, if I can do that, I can do something even greater tomorrow. You know, so I love that. 100%. Um, and I think one of the things that kind of people maybe don't like kind of leave out on these kinds of journeys is and one of the things that I really work on with people is to focus, for example, not just like on what you're eating as such, but how you're eating and people don't really talk about this as much right people always focus like on the physical like eat this eat this do this but there's actually a lot of research and there's a lot of evidence that the way that we eat has a massive impact and even possibly a bigger impact than the actual food that you're consuming so to give you um an example of this because that's why i really focus kind of like on, on mindful eating is one of the big things that i focus on um and you might have heard of this study before but there was a study done in the 1970s with rabbits and it's um there's a book called the rabbit effect that people can read if they're interested in this and basically there was a study that they took a bunch of rabbits and they gave them um an not very healthy diet and the idea was to see if there was a link between this diet and um, some health issues and on most of the rabbits they saw yeah they ate this food they had a health issue and there was one group of rabbits that um, ate the same food and had no health no negative health effects so they went in and they looked at it and they realized that the researcher that was in charge of those specific rabbits instead of just like throwing the food in the cage like they did with the other ones they took the rabbits out of the cage, they stroked them, they petted them, they were, you know, like how you would with a pet or how you would with a little child or something. And they fed the rabbits the food and the rabbits didn't have any negative health consequences, even though they were eating the exact same food, right? So I think there's, there's, and um, you know, that was the first study. And since then there's been lots of other studies that have been conducted that show that the way we eat is just as important as the actual food they're consuming. Um, and there's another really good example of this that you might have heard of, which is, um, have you ever read or heard of the hidden messages in water? No, I haven't. So it's, um, there's a book and there's a documentary and it's all about um, a doctor who researches the water crystals and he researches different water crystals from different areas. And um, he got people to um, like bless the water and send it love. And then they looked at it under a microscope and the water crystals that had you know like positive vibrations sent to them literally were really beautiful they were really beautiful they were really symmetric and they did the same where they tried to send you know like anger and all this and these other water crystals were all deformed and really ugly so this is like um, some of the evidence and that came out in the 90s and there's a lot of evidence that shows because our food and 
our bodies are mostly made up of water, right? Then that, that's why, for example, you know, blessing your food before eating it and feeling really, feeling lots of gratitude is going to completely change what you're actually consuming. That's really interesting. I totally believe it, but that is really interesting. Um, and I think that you hit the you hit it right on the nose when you said that, because for most of us, and I know myself growing up was guilty of this. If cake was in front of me or something, because it was a birthday party, instead of like mm -hmm. just enjoying the cake, I would think to myself, oh my gosh, is this going to be worth the calories that mm -hmm. I'm going to be consuming? Is it, I'd always, there was always the scale of how worthy is this of the exercise that I'm going to have to go through later to work this off. And I always, kind of had that in the back of my mind. So it would make sense that instead of blessing my food, I was actually cursing it and not realizing it. Yeah, and we, we all do this, right? That's why I really encourage people to, whatever you're gonna eat, anything you're gonna eat, firstly to try and you know send some kind of gratitude and just check in with yourself. Like before you sit down, are you feeling kind of a bit anxious, a bit angry, a bit stressed? If so, like take a few deep breaths and just wait a second before you consume it because you don't want to kind of kind of pass that negative energy into it, right? Um, and yeah, and to just try and be really, really mindful. Just try and eat slowly, enjoy it. Um, think about all the processes that involve to, you know, to get it onto your plate, like maybe the person in the store that um, had to organize it for you, you know, the person who um, drove it to work to the supermarket, the person that cooked it, like there's so much involved in it. So just to be really, really mindful and, and really, really grateful for that can just really, really help. That's really interesting. And I, I remember I was listening to, uh, I don't know if you follow the law of attraction at all, but I was listening to uh -huh. Jerry Esther Hicks. And that was one of the questions one time someone asked was, you know, why am I having so much trouble losing weight? And the response that was given was, um, well, okay, you know people in your life who can eat anything and it doesn't look like they gain any weight at all. And there's a reason for that. And that is that, you know, some people have a resistance even to the food we're eating just like what you were talking about so that seems very similar so yeah it's really similar to what you were saying is that you know people can eat anything and not gain weight but those people aren't constantly focused on the food they're eating they're just allowing it and it's kind of like in the flow and not you know stressing over it it's kind of similar to what you were saying Oh, yeah, 100% totally, because it's the same energy that you're putting in. And I think um, a very similar thing we can see kind of with exercise, because there are some people who exercise all the time, burn themselves out and don't get results. And I remember I used to see that as I remember I sometimes used to see exercise as this horrible thing that you have to do if you didn't want to be overweight and that's how I used to look at it back in my days I was like this is the horrible torture that I have to go through if I don't want to be overweight um which is just a really sad way to look at it right um and I think one of that's another one of the big things it's like when you can look at movement as something joyful there's something that's fun or something that is like a celebration of your body and you can really do it um for other reasons my big reason became as like a stress relief I found that he's going from someone that was a complete couch potato that you know never <laughs> hated doing any any kind of movement um once I started to learn that I could use it as a way to release stress it became like a fun thing it became something that was useful something that I enjoyed something that I could really really um get into and that's when I was you know you can because you're enjoying it therefore you're actually able to keep it up sustainably right like you were saying like it's just you have to you have to do something from a place of love you have to enjoy what you're doing otherwise it's never gonna stick not in the long term at least yeah, I totally agree with that. I tell people all the time, one of the things I like to do is Zumba because I like to dance. 
And so to mm-hmm. me, that is very similar to just dancing. And I know not everybody likes that, but you have to find what it is that you really enjoy doing. Because if I go into it going, okay, I'm going to have to do 50 squats today. <laughs> like, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to say, no, I don't want to do that. Like my knees, I have bad knees. I can't do that. You know, and you're going to talk yourself out of it. So you've got to find something that you find entertaining so that you can keep yourself coming back to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and that's also why I think like um, yoga can be a really, really good thing for, for a lot of people because it's kind of a combination between like a spiritual practice and also like a physical movement. So you can um, connect to your body in movement, but not just to do quote, you know, exercise, exercise, but just to learn to it. Like, like how you say dancing, right? Dancing is fun. It's not, you don't think, oh, I'm going to do exercise. You're like, I'm going to go and have a dance, right? It's it's an enjoyable addition to your life. It's not something that, that's holding you back. It's opening up even more, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that if you start changing the way you look at things, you know, again, not saying I have to go do this, but rather I want to because it's fun and I enjoy doing it. it you know, it doesn't even mean that the thing itself has to change. It's the way that you look at the thing that you're doing that has to change. And I know that you talked about how you do a lot of mindset work with people, which is great, because I think that's one of the biggest obstacles for people, not just in losing weight, but in every area of their life, the biggest obstacle is the mindset, because Mm -hmm. we're so programmed to focus on the negative and to go, oh, I have Mm -hmm. to do this again. And I Mm -hmm. think that that affects everything we do. Yeah. Um, definitely mindset is, is key in, in every, you know, way, shape and form. And I think one of the big things that um, I suggest to people is right at the beginning is firstly, you have to learn to accept yourself as you are. It doesn't mean that you can't change and you can't, you know, have a desire to, to change things, but you have to accept yourself exactly as you are in this moment. It doesn't mean, right, that, you know, when I was very, like I said, I was on the, I was basically obese. Um, when I say accept myself, I don't mean like I have to say this is great. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm super healthy. This is perfect. It just means like accept that that is where you are at right this moment. Um, it's not negative or positive. It's just where you are at, and if you can see it kind of in a more neutral kind of term, firstly, and kind of accept yourself on a deeper level because often it's connected to the way that we see ourselves and our spiritual connection and that kind of thing. Like if you don't accept yourself, um, at least internally as, you know, as, as a piece of the universe, as a little bit of God, as a little bit of spirit, as something connected to everyone, when you can even just see that as a little bit and you can say, you know, I'm, I'm worthy, I'm a decent person, I deserve good health. That's the biggest, the biggest step because a lot of times, when we are not in the exact position health-wise that we want to be in, it could be linked to the fact that we don't really feel that we deserve better. So I think like feeling that you, you deserve health and that you're, you know, worthy of being, having, you know, um, worthy of your wellness. Um, that's one of the big, the big steps forward. Um, and then the other one would be to just think, okay, like how can I do this? from a loving place so how can I move from an intuitive loving place how can I eat from a place that is loving and caring to myself and that's not going into this like kind of extreme restriction which is what we most of the time we think of it's like okay I'm not going to eat this I'm not going to eat this I'm not going to eat this and I really think it's the opposite what can you add to your life right what can you add instead of taking away? So I, um, I mainly work with women who struggle with sugar. And one of the things I say is don't think about all the different ways you can avoid sugar. Think, how can I include more whole foods into my diet? How can I add more fun? Because a lot of times we, we snack on things um, out of boredom more because we're kind of lacking some kind of enjoyment. So like, how can you add more fun? How can you add more self-care practices, right? How can you create a life that is just brimming with joy and is, is fun and is enjoyable? Because often when we're, you know, not doing these things, it's because our life in general is not as, not as fun and not as joyful as we would want it to be. Yeah, I really, really like that you do that, that instead of focusing on what the taking away is, you're focusing on what are you adding? 
because I think that that is what gets people over and over again is thinking that, okay, I'm going to be deprived. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about diets, a lot of those crash diets, are like, oh, just eat, you know, one thing and that's not healthy for you and it's not sustainable over a long period of time. So what people I think don't realize is that if you're eating the right way, you're actually probably going to be eating more food than you would have because you're just eating more of the right kinds of foods. And um, I don't think a lot of people even realize that. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you say that because that was definitely, um, at least in my like personal experience, definitely the case when I sort of transitioned towards a more whole foods, plant-based diet and away from kind of like processed stuff. And it was, yeah, the same like now I eat the, the biggest plates of food and I'm half the size <laughs> it's just, and I, I didn't even kind of think about that and we you, you kind of just mentioned that and um yeah I think the the restriction and the diets as well the, firstly scientifically proven over 90 percent of the time they don't work and people end up worse off than they were when they started and the other really big thing is that when you go through periods of restriction it tends to lead to periods of binging so I know at least personally um when you restrict something you're like okay i'm not allowed to have this i'm not allowed to have this we go into it's like our primitive side of our brain goes into that fight or flight mode so because we're not allowed something even if you know even if it's on the table and no one's telling you you can't have it even if it's just on your brain you're thinking that's a bad thing i'm not allowed to have that as opposed to you know what i'm choosing to have something else it's a different mindset right if you say to yourself i'm not allowed to have something um, then you end up wanting it 10 times more because you you're putting a restriction on yourself and this actually ends up leading to cycles of binging for a lot of people and that's why I really encourage everyone do not say I'm you know like you were saying earlier like don't say I'm not allowed to have something say I want to have this I choose to have this so as soon as you say to yourself like um when you categorize often a lot of people we, we categorize things this is good food this is bad food right this is guilty food and this is guilt-free food and those kind of labels and i know it, it makes sense like it feels kind of easy to use those labels but those kind of labels end up creating this restriction where we feel guilty towards something like we just discussed you feel guilty so then you're like sending it this negative energy because you're, you're you're infusing it with your guilt right and then you're restricting it so then you're going to go home you're going to feel unsatisfied and then you're probably going to binge on something else anyway way to make up for it at the end yeah i i can totally see that happening because the moment you put that thought in there that i can't have this i'm the type mm -hmm. of person, if you tell me i can't do something i'm gonna like figure out how to do it <laughs> because i'm so stubborn so i can see why and, and that's even in doing hypnotherapy we've learned how when you say can't that's a signal to the brain and it sends a specific signal. And so you don't ever want to use that term. So the fact that you are working with people and you're giving them alternative, even just alternative ways of thinking about the food, because it's not like, you know, what you're talking about isn't necessarily something that's so revolutionary. It's just that most people don't do that. We go, let's go to this diet where the diet says, no, you can't have what you can have. I mean, we've all seen those mm -hmm. we've seen the Pinterest posts or pins where it's like, can't, can, you know, so your brain goes, I can have this, I can't have that. But that's automatically setting you up to say, okay, now, but I want that in that mm -hmm. other column because you told me that I can't have it. So I really, really like that you do a lot of the mindset work while you're working with them on shifting their health, because that is a big, big chunk of it is the mindset piece that I don't think a lot of people do. There are coaches out there who do that, but I think a lot of them still haven't realized, like, you got to fix the mindset first before you can fix anything else. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that you know that took me it took me a while to learn that as well I definitely was focusing on the external the physical at first um but a lot of it is with we've, we've just been so conditioned um by um diet culture if you want to call it that we've been so conditioned from you know adverts from tv shows from comments that people make um and it's it's so strong that even sometimes um unfortunately like government health officials and like government guidelines sometimes 
probably unintentionally like reinforce this sometimes even some not all but some nutritionists and some dietitians and stuff like reinforce all of these beliefs but we kind of just take it as normal we kind of just think yeah that's normal um but we don't realize that it actually isn't <laughs> so a lot of the time I feel like when I'm teaching someone like to eat mindfully I'm literally just teaching them to eat like I'm just teaching you how to eat normally it's not it's like you said it's not revolutionary in the side it's just how it would normally be if we weren't so conditioned and so programmed from all these you know even generations of programming into different ways of looking at food um yeah that's such a big thing too because i mean i can remember being a child and my aunt always saying like i'm so fat or you know looking at Mm -hmm. and saying different things And she never, ever said anything to me, but I just got that that's how we were supposed to feel when we looked at ourselves in the mirror, like we were supposed to be, you know, conscious of how we looked. And I didn't realize that I didn't even put two and two together until later on in life when I thought I was doing the work of where have I heard this? Like, why am I so critical of myself? And I realized it's not really like somebody ever said to me, oh, you're so this or you're so that. It's more of, I watched other people say that to themselves and took that on as, oh, that's normal. (laughs) Yeah, we think it's like normal to um, just sort of like beat ourselves up, judge our bodies. Like it always brings me back to that scene in that movie Mean Girls where they're all standing around and like judging each other's bodies. And there's like Lindsay Lohan's like, oh, I, I didn't grow up that way. Like, I don't know how to judge myself. But and and that's actually complete like normal, right? I remember even just people I remember even teachers making comments at school about themselves and you just as a young person, you like you said, you just take it on board. So you think it's normal to look in the mirror and like be like disgusted by, you know, a tiny bit of skin or a little stretch mark or anything that's a slight imperfection. We've suddenly judged it as being this horrible thing that you should be upset about, you know, you should be if you put on a few pounds that's a reason to hate yourself and get depressed right and it's like (laughs) I was seeing someone um the other day was talking about it was like you know putting on a couple of pounds getting a spot like anything like you know a um, pimple you guys call it like that's not a bad day that's just something that we we kind of built that up to be like that's you know a really awful day you know a bad day is like someone dying like uh, you know something <laughs> like big happening but in our minds because we're so programmed we see that as like an awful day you know something really horrible happening to us Yeah, I mean, you're so right. And I can remember in school having a teacher try to fit like into the rows or in between the desk and hitting a desk or something with her her rear end and saying, oh, watch out, here comes hippo hips or something. You know, she made a comment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember that and that was seventh grade, but it made an impression. Mm -hmm. And think about all that we do in society when what do we glamorize? We glamorize celebrities and models and you know, the supermodel, that is not a realistic depiction of real women. I mean, you just, you know, it's just not the supermodel diet. That's like an unattainable for most people because uh, we did a study on this because there's so many instances of body shaming and, Mm -hmm. um, low self-esteem with body image issues with teenagers in school, even boys. It's not just limited to girls. It was like 40% Mm -hmm. of boys also have body image problems. And it's, to me, everything you see in the media and in magazines and all over, that's not helping any of our ideas of what healthy should be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really difficult because like you say we see it everywhere and the images that we see are super super airbrushed right and even even models that we could say have got very slender bodies and um right even they recognize that the magazines and the images are even more edited than they are in real life right so if it's already unattainable it's like 10 times more you know skin that's completely poreless right that that doesn't exist um and I think 
Social media at the moment is like a double-edged sword. I think it can be really positive and really negative for this because with social media, with all of these like filters and things and all of this, now everyone's becoming like, um, like a, what do you call it? Everyone's becoming like an amazing editor of their images. Like, you know, you don't need to know anything. Like you can yeah. Photoshop, you know, and you, there's a filter for every kind of bit of your body and stuff. So in, in that sense, it can be a bit alarming. But I think also in the other sense, a lot of people are just getting bored of that. Like we're all kind of waking up to that. We're all kind of realizing that it's fake and people are getting a bit bored. And there is some, you know, um, really great accounts out there of people that you can follow that are showing like real body. They're showing their stretch marks. They're showing, you know, a little bit of saggy skin, a little bit of whatever. Um, and I think it's a little bit now with how we have with the internet, you kind of need to put yourself first and curate what you allow in. And I think that's one of the other things that I work with people to do is like really curate what are you going to allow into your life, right? If you're going to look at something that instantly makes you feel down, makes you compare yourself, criticizes yourself, why do you let it into your life, right? And I know a lot of people, for example, um, with reality TV, sometimes um, people become like, you know, why don't I look like that? They, they fall in the comparison trap and they beat themselves up. But it's also your choice, right? It's your choice what you watch. It's your choice which accounts that you follow. Like, make that effort. Follow accounts that lift you up. Follow accounts of people that are promoting um, the idea of health that you believe in. You know, a health that the idea of health that comes from loving yourself and accepting yourself and and wanting better for yourself, not from crash diets, beating yourself up, judgmental, right? So I think it's kind of like a double-edged sword that like you can kind of, you can work to make it better. Like you, we have a choice now of which accounts, which people that we follow, like why not follow things that <laughs> make you feel better, right? Instead of dragging yourself down. Absolutely. I, I always tell people that you need to go through and declutter, not just your house, but your social mm -hmm. media too, and get rid of the things that bring you down because it does drain a little bit of your energy too. Every time you look at something that makes you feel bad. And yeah, I think that's a great idea. I love everything that you do and that you're representing. So if people want to work with you, how do you work with people? How can they follow you or how can they work with you? Yeah, so I um, at the moment I have an eight week program for women who are specifically looking to regain control of their sugar cravings. We focus on using mindfulness and the power of plants to do that. Um, and people can find me on Facebook and Instagram at the Vida Bonita and um, my website www.thevidabonita.com. And you can also reach me by email Maria Bonita at thevidabonita.com. Awesome. And I will have links to all of those places to your social media and your website and your email. So if people want to contact you, they can just click on those links and reach you directly. And I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. If there was one piece of advice that you could give our listeners right now who may be sitting there going, I've been stuck in the same cycle of not being able to lose weight and not feeling good about myself. What piece of advice would you give them? I'd say that true, healthy, sustainable change can, can only ever come from self-love. You can't hate yourself to great health. I love that. And that's absolutely 100% true. If you are beating up on yourself on the regular, uh, it's going to be hard to make those changes that really make a difference in your life. For sure. Well, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. No, thank you for being here with me. This is such a fun conversation. I really, really, truly enjoyed it. And you're welcome to come back anytime because I know I have a lot of listeners who struggle with weight or just even just loving their bodies, not even the weight, mm -hmm. but just getting healthy and loving their bodies. So really appreciate you taking your time to come out and talk to us today about it. And, and uh, so thank you and come back anytime. Thank you so much, Melissa. This has been absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. And I want to thank all of you for being here with us today as well. As always, if you like this podcast, please subscribe. Please leave a positive review from wherever you're listening. You can leave me some stars on iTunes. As you know, the most amazing compliment you can pay me is to refer me to others. So if you think there's anyone else that might enjoy this podcast, please share it with them. Also, if you want to follow me, 
You can follow me on social media. I go live in my Facebook group every Monday at 6.30 Central where I do a free card reading. And if you show up for the live, I'll pull a card especially for you. I post videos to Instagram and I have free guided meditations on my YouTube channel. So check all of that out. And if you would like to work with me, you can go to my website, melissaoatman.com. There you'll see all the services I offer. You can book directly from my website and contact me to schedule your appointment. All of my sessions are done online through Zoom, so you never have to leave the comfort of your own home. I hope that you guys are having a beautiful day from wherever you're listening. As always, I am sending you so much love and light, and I will talk to you soon. Bye, guys.